In June, Democratic state lawmakers advanced legislation to create a registration system for short-term rentals, like on Airbnb or VRBO, and make it easier to collect sales and occupancy taxes on overnight accommodations. The bill also ensures that municipalities may enact a local law prohibiting or restricting short-term residential units, if they so please. To discuss the legislation, which does not apply to New York City, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Nathan Rotman, the Northeast Policy Lead for Airbnb. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on today. It's our pleasure. So supporters of this bill argue that it will essentially standardize what has emerged to be a patchwork system of registries and taxes uh, around New York. Is that your understanding of the impact of the short-term rental legislation awaiting the governor's signature, or do you think it could be more disruptive to the status quo than that? If anything, it is the opposite of standardizing. What this bill will do is duplicate existing regulations at the local level and bring it up to the state level as well. We are a hyper-local organization. We operate in homes, in villages, in towns, in cities, all around the world, all around New York State. And we're regulated at that local level. Some of it's zoning regulations, some of it's business licensing, some of it's health and safety. It, it changes based on the local need in that community. The needs in Rochester are not the same as in Southampton or in uh, Syracuse. So they all have their own types of regulation in various cities all around and, and towns and villages all around the state. Where those laws exist, those, those, those various ordinances, we let the hosts know what their requirements are under those laws. Under this law, if I am a, a registered host in Buffalo, I will also have to register at the state level. So like, it creates this entirely new system where you have to kind of get two licenses to operate. Like you only need one license to drive a car, but you need two licenses to share space in your home for a weekend while you're away on vacation or for a month while you're off to school. It has a couple of other provisions as well, forcing hosts to get very expensive uh, insurance products that we already provide to our hosts, like very significant insurance. Uh, requires that the, the disclosure of significant personal information and actually leaves some of the tax dollars that we've long supported the state collecting from our industry on the table uh, uncollected. And we think that we should be collecting the same taxes as the, as the traditional uh, accommodation providers, the hotels across the state. And we've long supported bills uh, in the state legislature that would create that, that level playing field between us and them. So there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Let, let's start with the idea of this being duplicative. And you raised the idea of a host uh, being licensed in Buffalo and now having to get licensed at, at the New York level as well. Aren't there some municipalities, possibly many, that don't have any sort of registration and license and thus would now have a statewide system covering all those people? So while it might be redundant for the people who have been licensed already, wouldn't this fill in the gaps elsewhere? Uh, so you're in some ways going to make the point of what we what we uh, tried to, to to propose to the to the sponsors of, of, of this bill, which is it should be one or the other. Either we're regulated at the city level, at the municipal level, or we're regulated at the state level. Well, well my understanding is now if this bill was signed into law, no municipalities could create any additional registries moving forward. The existing ones could stay in place, but you couldn't have additional municipal ones on top of the state registry in the future. That's right. So in over 150 municipalities where they already have local registration systems, those hosts will be required to register twice for, you know, for, for, for no apparent reason. Um, and then all new municipalities wouldn't be able, any municipality that doesn't already have one of these registration systems in effect, would be prohibited from creating a new one. That's that. So, so this creates a patchwork of different systems all across the state. If I'm in Buffalo, I need two licenses. If I'm in, you know, some town, I I, I can't even, you know, I don't I don't actually have a name on top of my head. It doesn't have a registration system. Actually, let's just, you know, I think Rochester is an example. It doesn't have a registration system at the moment. You know, I'll only have to register at the state level. So it just creates this like very haphazard kind of spread, like different system depending on where you live. The reality is like there's there are simpler ways to do this. Either you tell the cities, you regulate. You tell the counties, you regulate. Or you tell the state, you regulate. Having to get two different, like there are, there are no places, certainly no places in the United States where you need to get two different licenses to operate a short-term rental in your home. And so that registration requirement at two different levels is a real outlier and just puts a lot of onus on hosts who are 
in many cases only operating a couple of nights a year. Like our hosts aren't uh, all these professional investors that uh, uh, some of uh, the, the hotel associations uh, would love would love you to think. They're people who are renting their homes on an occasional basis. They're renting their their properties upstate that they use on an occasional basis on Airbnb to make some extra money. Folks in Albany, I was just there because they're thinking about an ordinance in Albany. They don't have a registration system yet, so they would be prohibited from creating one. But the hosts in Albany really operate because there's big, big conferences, and they know that they can make some extra income in their homes on an occasional basis, supporting all of the visitors that come to Albany for all of those different events that, that go on. So you mentioned the insurance requirement uh, that is laid out in the legislation, and I think a host is required to have insurance that covers uh, the value of the dwelling. In cases of Airbnb, I believe your company provides some sort of insurance coverage. Would this mean then that the host would have to get their own coverage in addition to what Airbnb offers? Or is there language in the legislation that would allow the Airbnb coverage to suffice and fill that requirement? Great question. In almost every jurisdiction, when we share with states or with cities what our insurance coverage is, what air cover, which is our, our insurance product, covers both hosts and guests for, they say that is that is way more than, than the average. We are more than happy to take that. In this particular bill, a lot of the hosts who've checked with their local insurers are saying that they're going to be having to, to put out many, many hundreds, or in some cases, thousands, depending on the, on the location or the type of property, uh, in order to buy additional insurance well above and beyond the coverage that we already provide for their liability property, as well as guests' liability. So, you know, we think about it both from the guest perspective and the host perspective as a, as a two-sided marketplace, but it's a real outlier to require uh, a much higher threshold of insurance than, uh, than what we already provide and what hosts already have on their homes as responsible homeowners who have other obligations, you know, to themselves and to their, to their communities uh, under, under local laws. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining us. This is the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with Nathan Rotman, the Northeast Policy Director for Airbnb. So the legislation makes it uh, unlawful for a booking service like uh, Airbnb or VRBO to facilitate a booking if that property hasn't been registered with the Department of State. How would you go about complying with that mandate? Have you thought about what that process would be like to actually ensure that someone who's signing up for your site has also signed up for the Department of State's uh, registry? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really complicated process. And so what happens in, 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 in you know, different, different parts of the world where, where they have these kinds of laws is that we work with the community or the city and the state that puts those laws into effect on, on what that will look like. It's not defined in this piece of legislation, so that would really be left to a discussion with the state department. But in most cases, we're happy to work with, or in, sorry, not in most cases, where there are local laws, we are happy to work with that community to ensure that there is compliance with that law. And so... A city can let us know that there is a registration requirement. We will ensure the hosts get registered. The city can let us know that certain hosts have expired licenses or they you know, broke a local ordinance with regard to noise or nuisances and that they should be removed. And we're willing to work with all of those communities based on their laws to ensure that we're being good members of the community, that our hosts are acting responsibly in the community, that our guests aren't causing nuisances. We have a lot of rules, terms of service, that are you know preventing parties uh, and other kind of nuisances on, on the platform, and so there's a, there are many different ways to kind of achieve that goal. What we shared as an industry with the, the sponsors um, was a proposal to actually do something fairly similar, where the state would let us know who needs to be removed, and we would remove those properties. And so there are simpler ways than I think what has been designed in this particular bill with the language that they've written. And certainly we're looking forward to having discussions with the State Department, depending on you know where this bill goes over the, over the next couple of months. Yeah, are you going to be advocating that the governor veto this bill? Do you want the chapter amendments or are you just focusing now on the regulatory framework that emerges with the Department of State, whether it has to do with the registry or application fees? How, how are you approaching this as an advocate now? We believe that there are significant changes that should be made to this bill, the insurance requirement that we spoke about, the way the registration system we spoke about, as well as some of the platform requirements and how that could be streamlined a lot better. In many ways, we can support the sponsor's 
goals. We don't like the way that they have gone about designing it. And so, you know, we have reached out to the state department and, and folks in the, in the, uh, you know, in the executive chamber to have those discussions. And we're looking forward to continuing, uh, you know, a positive collaboration in an effort to find a way that we can create a system that really works for our hosts, for our guests, and for all of the, you know, uh, the, the towns and communities across the state who really depend on tourism, uh, bringing visitors into their communities, spending uh, money in those in, in, in small businesses across the state, and uh, providing the, the tax revenue that many of these communities are, are very uh, interested in raising. Well, when it comes to tax revenue, how does Airbnb, for example, go about collecting sales taxes or local occupancy taxes when applicable? And how could this legislation potentially lower the amount uh, of taxes that are being collected? Uh, yeah, great question. So, so for years and years, we have advocated for a, a standard approach where we would collect the sales taxes at the local and at the state level. Um, in a centralized way for, for all of New York State. That has been something that, you know, former Governor Cuomo had, had uh, put forward, Governor Hopeful has put forward, hasn't made its way through the budget process, unfortunately, and I think, I think in about three different attempts at, at this point. In the meantime, we've entered into over 30 voluntary collection agreements with county governments across the state to ensure that we are collecting uh, the local uh, accommodation taxes. Since those taxes go directly to the counties to support uh, you know, housing, economic development, tourism promotion, all kinds of things uh, that the, uh, that the, the, the county is uh, responsible for. And so, and we're, I believe we are the only platform who's currently doing that, that you know, collection of remittance uh, in, these, in these individual communities. We just signed an agreement with Erie County just a few weeks ago uh, to, to start collecting the, uh, the, their accommodation tax there. They had reached out and wanted to enter into an agreement. But there is a better way to ensure that the accommodation taxes, sales taxes are all collected across the board. And I think that we've got a, a very good proposal supported by our other industry colleagues uh, to centralize that, that approach. In Tennessee, they saw a like, like hundreds of percent increase in tax compliance because when you leave it to individual hosts, individual counties, individual cities with their occupancy taxes, you're putting a lot of pressure both on these like small town governments, but also on individual hosts who are operating in some cases like 30, 40 nights a year uh, to also look into all of their tax requirements. We would love to do that on their behalf in a centralized fashion, just like we do in a bunch of different states across the country, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and, and many others. And we've been proposing this in New York for quite some time. This particular law, the way that they've designed it, leaves some of that tax revenue on the table. And uh, and we've, we've gone in with proposals to both the uh, Department of Revenue, as well as to the uh, the legislature, to say you know you're leaving money on the table. We think we should be collecting all of this, and here's a better way to go about it. So we hope uh, that we'll be able to have those discussions uh, to to maximize you know the state and the counties and the, the communities' returns. Well, what is the shortcoming then about the tax collection method that the state would be moving forward uh, under this legislation? Why is it uh, suboptimal? It doesn't tax all accommodations the same way, uh, and so it leaves certain types of, of accommodations off the requirement to collect. Uh, it doesn't treat all the platforms the same way, and so we want to make sure that all platforms are required to collect the same thing. All accommodation types are taxed the same, um, and so it's uh, this is kind of a complex piece of tax law. It's a tiny bit over my head, I'll be honest, um, but that we've uh, we've provided some language uh, both to the sponsors and to the Department of Revenue that we think would. Uh, ensure that there's that all of the, the dollars are collected appropriate. Well, finally, the legislation calls for a uh, application registration fee as well as a renewal fee that would ultimately be set by the Department of State. One, are you supportive of a registration fee like that? And two, do you have any concerns about the figure that they might come up with? Because we've seen a variety of fees proposed in municipalities uh, around the state. For example, in Saratoga Springs, there was a $1,000 fee floated for a two-year permit. So so how do you think about a registration fee, which, according to the sponsors, is designed uh, to fund uh, the cost of maintaining and operating the registry? Every community that has a registration system, in most of them, they have some fee. And those fees range from a 
as low as like $50 up to a couple hundred dollars. Saratoga's proposal is obviously higher on popular tourist destination, obviously. Um, but people should also remember that our hosts aren't, you know, doing this full time. And so just as an example, last year in Erie County, just as that example, because I've got it in front of me, our, our hosts, an average host earned about $13,000. So they're not working full time at this. They're not doing this on a full time basis. They're operating a couple of nights a year. They're operating a few weeks a year in some cases. And so they should be very cognizant of, you know, of, of limiting the barrier of entry uh, for hosts to, 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 to get appropriately registered to operate in their community. In places like Buffalo, where there's already a local registration system, you're now talking about duplicating two different registration fees, one at the city level and one at the state level. And so we're obviously concerned and we'll be advocating for you know, an appropriate approach uh, if, they, uh, if, they, if they keep this statewide registry approach that they're contemplating in this legislation, um, you know, to something that, that's reasonable considering what the, the market, you know, can, can afford and what the hosts uh, uh, would be able to, to withstand. We've been speaking with Nathan Rotman. They're the Northeast policy lead for Airbnb. Nathan, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks for your time, David. Capital Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.